Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paolo Tonella, and I'm going to chair the session on the Harlan D. Mills Award. And uh, let me find out how to progress on the slides. Yep. So this award was established in memory of Harlan D. Mills, and uh, the idea of the award is to recognize uh, long-standing, sustained, and impactful contributions in our area. So we have to recognize the importance of our giants. And if you have a look at the list of the previous recipients uh, from 1999 to the last year, you will recognize a lot of giants in the list. So for this year's award, we have formed a committee consisting of five people. And I take this opportunity to thank each of them because of the work they did. It was very appreciated. And I had the pleasure, the pleasure to head the committee. So the process for this award consists first of the collection of nominations. This year, for this year's award, we had seven nominations. Then uh, the program committee, mem the members of the committee, of the selection committee declared their conflicts. And then every member, every non-conflicted member expressed their preferences um, in terms of the top three rankings. The top one was granted three points, two to the second and one to the third. And in this way, we got uh, a list of, uh, a short list uh, of uh, nominees. And then uh, we had a discussion for the selection of the actual award from the top three. Um, in reality, this year there was not much discussion because uh, there was quite uh, an ample consensus on the winner. Before moving on and announcing the winner, let me tell you something more about nominations. As I said, it's very important that we give recognition to the main contributors in our fields, to the giants, and that you have an opportunity to nominate somebody for the Harlan D. Mills Award for the next year. The deadline for the nomination is October 1st, so there's quite some time to prepare the nomination package. So please consider doing that. So now I hand it over to the IEEE Computer Society President, Anita Pato, who will announce the winner for this year. Thank you, Paolo. It's my privilege to announce this year's winner, Professor David Harrell, who has provided sustained and impactful contributions to software engineering practice and research. Many applications use his benefits from the work he's done and implemented, specifically the impact of state charts and live sequence charts on Software engineering has been quite profound, I'm sure. We were just talking earlier before the starting and thinking back to even within my industry having used state charts in software design. I'm very honored in this contributions and honored to congratulate Dr. David Harrell on this award. Please join us. The pleasure to listen to a retrospective talk by David Harrell on his contributions to the field. Please. What he didn't tell you is that I bribed the committee. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for the award. Um, this is going to be, it should have been a one hour long presentation, but I'm told it's shorter. Someone once went to Bernard Shaw and said, I've only been given 30 minutes to talk about this and that topic. How can I get everything I know about it into 30 minutes? And Bernard Shaw said, speak very, very slowly. So most of, most of the slides you'll see here are over 40 years old. Um, some are 25 years old, and a couple are newer. So late 1982 to mid-1983, I consulted at the Israel Aircraft Industries on an advanced avionics project just for a few months, uh, one day a week. Um, this uh, is what 
success in a software development project should look like. I don't know if you can see my... Uh, anyway, uh, everything should go fine. You can see the, the age of this slide because of the 2167 standard. Um, everything is fine. It's done on time. Um, and there are no people here because everyone is beyond the horizon uh, because it's been so successful. What I discovered, and I'm sure many of you have, is that the, um, the real process looks a lot more like this, uh, with all kinds of problems and pitfalls and places to get stuck. Uh, again, you can see Ada here, which gives you a feeling for how old this slide is. Uh, the problem is that here there are no people either, but for quite different reasons. They are all stuck right down at the bottom left of the slide in the specification gridlock. If we zoom in, uh, we see people scratching their heads trying to understand requirements, specifications, whatever. And to be slightly more responsible about this point, uh, the thing, uh, by the way, uh, the person on the left was drawn by the artist in our department as a man, but of course this was in 1982, you cannot show a slide like that. So I added some, some hair to make it uh, gender balanced. Um, and so on the one hand, you have the group of people who say what they want or think they know what they want. And on the other hand, there are the people who have to put that, uh, make, make something out of it, build the hardware and the software. Those are the implementers. And the problem is not just how to write the specification. The problem is the communication between these two. And the communication is not just a question of language. It's a much deeper issue, as I'm sure you know. And the one thing that I um, decided was the, the central issue here was specifying behavior. There were pretty good ways to specify structure and uh, the pieces of the system, and maybe a little bit about what each of them should do, but to specify behavior uh, clearly so that the people on the left can, can, can say what they want and the people on the right can understand what the people on the left want and then go and build a system to do this clearly and precisely. Those are the two keywords. That is, and that was, uh, for, for me doing that consulting, uh, the heart of the problem. And I want to show you something that I've shown many, many times for decades. This is part of a real spec, not an avionics project. It had to do with some chemical plant. And this, uh, this document was about 600 or 700 pages long. I had it in my hotel room at some point. And I tried to find one small but crucial piece of behavior and to see how it was reflected, how it was written up in this document. And I found that piece of behavior appearing three times in the document. Everything on this slide is accurate except for the page numbers, which I forgot to copy, so I made them up. Very early on, there was a clause 2.7.6. This is how these documents are built on security. Uh, and it said, if the system sends a signal hot, then send a message to the operator. Later on, much later on, there was a section on temperatures where it said, if the system sends a signal hot and T is greater than 60 degrees, then send a message to the operator. The real gem was the third place, which was right at the end of the document. There was a summary of some of the crucial uh, behavioral points in this, in this system. And there it said, and this is written down exactly, including the lack of punctuation. When the temperature is maximum, comma, the system should display a message on the screen unless no operator is on the site except when T is less than 60 degrees. Now, prior to this work, I, I had been uh, trained and brought up and did my PhD in logic. And as a logician, I have never until this very day been able to figure out whether this third statement is equivalent to or implies or is implied by any of the previous two. Now, the, this is not a joke. This is the document that is used by the programmers to build the system. And, and then go be surprised when things blow up and things don't work the way you want. But let's get back to that consulting. And I, I made some uh, copies of my notes from 1982. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing this just to give you a little bit of a feeling for how this visual language developed, at least in, in, in my personal mind. So the first attempt I made when listening to these people speak about the system was to use a logical formalism. I said, you know, I grew up in, as a logician, or computer science logic, and I started to use modal style temporal operators. So that's my notebook, and if you look at the bottom right, can you see these arrows? Yeah, so on, on the left you see, on the left here you see uh, uh, this kind of uh, logical formalism, on the right you see some modal operators. Uh, this was my first attempt. 
The second attempt, I tried to make up a structured state-based language talking about states and substates, and this looked more or less like this. You can see the indentation. But notice the doodling that I used on the right, like to scribble little, little pictures to explain to the people I was trying to talk to what I really meant in this more rigorous uh, state-based structured uh, language. But then over a, a few days, a few weeks, the doodling started taking center stage. And then instead of writing these things down, I used to draw these pictures. Uh, and here you can notice uh, the beginnings of a hierarchy with states inside states and transitions that go from lower levels to higher levels uh, and so on. Also note the first use of this concurrency operator in state charts orthogonality, which I denoted by dashed lines. Um, and here I was explaining to them what it means, and on, on the top of this, over here, you can see an and or tree. So I, I explained to them that an orthogonal state and within it some substates is really an and of ors. Um, then I you know, did, did things to enhance expressiveness and to make uh, things more improved, and things began to look a little more orderly. Uh, noted, note here the first time that I used um, orthogonality within orthogonality. That's very important. So people say, oh, state charts is just a bunch of communicating state machines. Well, no, because you can have the orthogonality on any level. So the, the state at each point is a vector which is flexible. It can get smaller or larger as you move in and out of, uh, of these states which have uh, OK, so that's what I say here. State is a flexible vector of atomic states. And notice that on top, uh, mathematically, um, I, I use a Cartesian product, which, of course, is the natural way mathematically to describe this orthogonality uh, notion. And then uh, it started coming out as, as a language. I wasn't thinking of a language. I was thinking of drawing pictures that make sense. Um, and then I started to define things more properly, at least for, for the beginning, to, for myself. And this is the first time that I decided that the interesting notion here uh, is not a start state, because the system does not necessarily start in this state, but it's a default state, because it can occur on any level. So the system can be working for a year, and then you go into some lower level state. It has some substance. States, and what you get there is not a start state, but the default state, which is really a generalization of the notion of a start state in, uh, in automata theory. Uh, and then I wrote a document in, uh, in September of 1980, I think this should be 82, actually, maybe 83, uh, for the use of the avio avionics people. And so here is, is really on the bottom, it's written in Hebrew, I apologize, but uh, the first uh, uh, attempt to, to use this little language, which wasn't yet a formal language, uh, for some application. And I'll just translate on the left, you see, so this is a big orthogonal component, uh, and on the left you get the uh, modes of operation of this particular aircraft, air, 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 ground, auto navigation, and being on the ground. Um, and then here you have the radar, the INS, the communications uh, as orthogonal uh, components. In early 1985, um, uh, I took a plane trip with the late Amir Pnueli. And uh, by the way, we, he's, he's no longer alive, as you know, but uh, we, uh, our offices are about 10 or 12 meters from one another at the Weizmann Institute, but I used to meet him mainly uh, in Australia, in New York, in Paris, and on airplanes. And so a plane trip with him, we discussed, so he, he liked this idea of state charts a lot, and we tried to pinpoint what kinds of systems is this good for? Not necessarily for doing a, you know, a sorting algorithm, so what is it good for? And the result of this uh, one hour discussion was the notion of a reactive system. And, uh, and we, we decided not only that this is a good term, a reactive system, but that this is really the critical issue in these kinds of complex systems. So a reactive system is not transformational. It doesn't take inputs, blah, 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 and produce outputs, but rather it has inputs and outputs all the time. And you have to respond sometimes in real time, sometimes concurrently, sometimes in a distributed fashion. But the bottom of this slide, the point is that whereas the green versions are all usually easier than the blue versions. Concurrency is more difficult than sequentiality. Real time is more difficult to do than, than lazy time. And things that are distributed are more difficult to specify than things that are centralized. But the more important 
a distinction is between being reactive and being transformational, and reactive can be any of the things on the bottom, just makes things a lot more complicated. But the crucial issue for which this problem of specifying behavior is really, really difficult is the notion of a reactive system. And at the time, this also is a very old slide, there were many, many examples of reactive systems, there are many more today, but even then, uh, I already identified that things like biological systems and financial and social systems are to be included in this uh, 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 definition of dis discrete reactive behavior. Um, from 84 to 87, I tried to get the state charts paper published. I don't know how many of you know this, it took me three years to get this paper published. Um, uh, the, the first version had a slightly different title, State Charts, a visual tool for the design and specification of complex system. The date on top here is December 1983. Um, the graphics, uh, so if you get your hand on the hard, uh, hard copy of this paper, uh, the, I, I managed to convince the journal to incorporate a folding picture of this uh, citizen watch, which opens, I think, three or four folds. This was my handwritten uh, version of that, uh, of that example. Uh, and the paper was rejected once, one time after another from communications of the ACM, from IEEE computer, a second time from IEEE computer, a special issue on something, uh, then from IEEE software. Um, I have a whole bunch of interesting editor and reviewers reports. Some of them didn't even read the paper. They said it's too long, too many pictures. Some of them said, oh, this is all easy. It's just finite automata. Some said this will never be useful. Um, and finally, I gave in to Amir Penueli's prodding to have this published in uh, a rather obscure journal in theoretical computer science called uh, called the Science of Computer Programming, of which he was one of the editors, and even he, it took him two or so years to get reviewers to, to agree to review uh, the paper. So it was finally published three and a half years after I first submitted it, but uh, at the time, I don't know how many of you were around then, we used to get little cards asking for reprints, so I have a whole pile of requests of those, and it was published in this uh, journal, Science of Computer Programming. A slight error uh, beneath the title and the author, it says, uh, when it was received, um, it should be December 85, not December 84. This uh, rather painful process, uh, I think, is especially interesting, uh, given the following, and excuse me for the next couple of slides, but I thought it would be, um, uh, especially for the younger generation, do not give up. Uh, if you feel something you're doing is good, just push and push and push until it gets published with the hope that no one will do the same thing earlier and get it published elsewhere. So in 2000, September 2002, there was no Google Scholar then, there was something called Sightseer, and the State Charts paper was the second most widely cited paper in computer science, uh, which is nice. But what's even nicer is the third paper was the RSA paper which has since then, of course, overtaken state charts in, uh, in popularity, uh, the reverse Shamir Edelman paper. And these days, um, the paper has uh, over 11,000 uh, uh, citations. The next thing that happened that is relevant to this story is to think of state charts not just as a language for describing the behavior of a single component or a single piece of software or hardware, but to embed this in a structure. And of course, a very famous way of doing structure at the time was functional decomposition. So we defined activity charts, which are really functions, components that are functional, and we link these with state charts in a non-trivial way. I mean, today maybe it's very easy, but at the time it was, uh, and we designed and built a, t a tool called StateMate. Uh, the, the paper on statement, which I'll mention in a minute, has seven uh, authors. One of them was Amir Pinoeli, Levi Sherman, Michal Politi, and, and two other people who were instrumental. By the way, here in the audience, one of my uh, late blooming PhD students, Raz Yoshalme, uh, was not on that paper, but he joined iLogix a little bit afterwards and worked on statement quite a bit. I like this uh, photo. Uh, I, I know you don't believe this, but this is me. Uh, explaining visual formalisms in 1984. And um, so visual, you can see the visuality. This is state charts on the blackboard, on the whiteboard. Um, and you can see the formalism because when I had to explain the formal semantics of this, I often used things like temporal logic. Another interesting part of this picture 
is the proof of how long ago this picture was, 1984. So um, this is not exactly what you, what you see um, these days. Uh, I want to say a couple of words on these two terms, visual and formal, uh, leading to this term uh, of visual uh, formalism. Uh, visuality, a good visual language, does not start with things that are round or square or yellow or red or thick or thin, but things topological. Are these two things connected? Is one inside the other? And so on and so forth. Then, of course, you can use geometry. So a square might be different from a triangle. Uh, a thick line might be different from a thin line. And then you can use icons, you know, for a file, for a clock, for wh whatever. Uh, a lot of times people say my language is visual, and they're really just using icons instead of keywords. And this is fine, but the, 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 the human brain understands topology very, very well if presented in two dimensions or in three dimensions. So if you're trying to do a visual language and you want it to be useful, and the usefulness of such languages is, is like uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You can't force people to like your language. Uh, for example, there's a big difference between petri nets and state charts, although mathematically they are different. And one of them is slightly uh, less useful because there's no natural notion of hierarchy. And, uh, even if you don't care to explain the difference, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I think one of the main advantages of state charts is the fact that topology is, is a key feature of the, um, of the language. And of course, for when I don't think I have to explain this to this audience, again, this is a very old slide, remember, from the 1980s. But at the time, there was a myth that a formal specification is a formal-looking specification. The more Greek letters you have in your specification, the more impressive it is. And of course, that is a farce. That's not true. A formal language is one that has a rigorously defined syntax, a rigorously defined semantic domain, and a rigorously defined semantic function taking the former to the latter. There's a, a paper that I wrote with Bernard Rumpe a few years back that you can look, at, look up, in which we explain this notion of what uh, formal and semantic really is. And I mentioned StateMate already. I want to pause on this for a minute. So this tool was built in 1986. Um, it was, and this is essentially a quote from one of the awards that, that it received, it, the first tool to offer comprehensive model-based system development with fully executable visual formalisms, in this case state charts and the activity charts I mentioned for behavior. Um, and because this is the ICSI conference, um, and this is an award session. So um, this paper was first published in ICSI in 1986. And at the time, there was a best paper award. I don't know if this is still the case, where the committee chooses the best paper presented at the conference. But then 10 years later, the same paper got the award that will be presented soon, the most influential paper award for the same paper at the same conference in 1996. And at some point in between these two, the paper was published in, um, in IEEE uh, Transactions on Software Engineering. Uh, but really, the, the highlight in terms of the recognition of this paper was that uh, the seven of us received the uh, 2007 ACM Software System Award. As an aside, I, I was chosen by, by the authors to, to thank the, uh, for the award. And one of the things I said there was that uh, it's interesting that uh, you've chosen to give me uh, a, a software system award, and I haven't written a line of software for 25 years myself. So students, yes, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that came across very, very well. Um, I hope this works. This is a clip pre-YouTube that I've been using for many, many years to illustrate the advantages of a model of behavior that can be executed. Um, and I hope this works, and I hope you can also hear the audio. So this is the real thing. This is the simulation. <laughs> yeah, I agree, that's quite, quite cool. Um, 
Um, one, uh, one mishap here was that uh, we had a detailed document giving the state chart semantics as embedded in the StateMate tool. This was an internal iLogix document. I didn't think it was that important to publish, and uh, we got uh, hit by several people who said that the language has no semantics, so you can interpret differently. And so only 10 years later, we finally published um, uh, you know, a real paper giving the StateMate semantics of uh, state charts in transactions and software engineering methodology. 1992 to 1995, we defined the object-oriented version of state charts, which was, of course, a lot more attractive because objects were becoming uh, center stage, and we built the object-oriented variant or version of StateMate, which had different features. In particular, it was less an interpreter and more of a compiler, uh, and this was done also at iLogix with uh, Eran Geri, and again, I think Razi Rushalmi is here, and he was one of the key people working also on that uh, at the time. From 1996 on, I just, I'm giving a very brief list of several of the things that I've been involved in. So at the beginning when I decided to give this talk as a retrospect, I was not going to concentrate on this, but I do want to make a list of some of the things that grew out of uh, this, this early work. Uh, I mentioned already biological modeling, so I've spent 25 years doing many, many projects on modeling complex pieces of biology, mostly using state charts, but not always, sometimes variants and sometimes scenario-based. Um, and if I, if I have uh, uh, two minutes, I'll show you an example of that. And then was mentioned already scenario-based programming and life sequence charts with the two very, I think, uh, elegant ideas of playing in behavior from a GUI and playing it out uh, on a GUI. Um, and uh, one of the key figures here uh, is Shahar Maoz, my, an ex-PhD student who is also here and I think has three papers at this conference. So the children are, are making us feel good. Um, uh, we did some work on, on a natural language interface to these kinds of programming, and uh, I think a very, very interesting idea of show and tell, where to explain how this works, I show you stuff, but I also tell you about it, and we merge playing with the GUI with natural language to specify behavior. Uh, one important issue is to link a state-based approach with a scenario-based approach. Link in a deep way so that you can build a system, parts of it are specified using states, parts of it are specified using scenarios, but the entire semantics and the execution is uh, smoothly uh, connected. Uh, I've done some work on using state charts to specify how people draw pictures and how they play music uh, with some applications to arts and music therapy. Um, I would recommend, so in red here, there is a paper from five years ago in IEEE Computer. I would uh, humbly recommend that you take a look at that paper because it gives kind of a vision for wise computing. Yes, I know about chat GPT, and I know that people are trying to program using chat GPT. We're also looking into that, but still, this does not shed the responsibility we have for defining languages and methods for doing real software and systems engineering. Um, and I, I would really recommend that you read this easy to read paper. There are two uh, demos linked to inside the paper of how we see this thing uh, happening. Um, these days, we're uh, trying to enhance uh, deep learning, learning networks with scenario-based programming. One example is to give scenarios that depict the, the, um, the uh, uh, restraints, the constraints, or the, sp or the specification of what you want of the system, and uh, this is not exactly true verification of neural nets, it's not exactly explainability, but it's taking steps towards making these things less transparent. And finally, something that's not directly uh, linked to this, but what I wanted to mention, nevertheless, is a paper we just uploaded last week to archive on the question that I think is the much more um, uh, timely and important issue to, uh, to um, be generated or to be spawned by or to be um, uh, inspired by the Turing test, which is not to tell whether a computer is intelligent like a human, but to tell whether I'm talking to or communicating with a human or with a machine. And here we don't, it's not a technical paper, it's a very, very easy read. We simply raise the issues. Do you always want people, I'm sorry, do you always want an agent to let you know whether it's a person or a machine? If you know, does that change your behavior? What are the issues? And so we're trying to surface things. Most of what is written in this paper is almost obvious, uh, but we just finished it, uh, at least the first version, 
and I recommend that. And now, if I have two more minutes, I'm going to try to show you an old, 20 years old um, um, uh, demo of a very complex piece of uh, behavior specified solely with state charts. So this is uh, differentiating T cells in the thymus. Um, many, of, many objects, each object has a state chart, complex internal behavior, a lot of interaction, and a lot of movement, and an enormous amount of biological knowledge that had to be assimilated and modeled, especially by our PhD student Solifoni at the time, almost 400 papers. Um, and we used state charts in Rhapsody, connected to Flash, any of those of you who remember that, via a novel reactive animation techniques technique that kind of lets the system run and does the animation as a side effect of that. Uh, this is what the front end looks like. I won't have time to explain the diagonal things. They're not just lines, they are epithelial cells. All the circles in the various colors are these cells. They all vie to reach this area over here on the right, which is when they become fully fledged grown up T cells. Uh, and they compete in order to do that. The, chemi the chemistry and the biology of the competition I won't be able to get into. But I want to show you uh, the model in execution. And when you look at this, just take into account that each of these uh, circles is a very complicated state chart, and they're all running in parallel. The thing you will see now about left of the center in the cortex is gradually these cells try to communicate with the epithelial cells. This has uh, the, if you manage to, to interact correctly with the, the epithelial cells, you will get the, uh, uh, the ability to then jump over to the medulla on the right in this picture and become a fully fledged T cell. The little X's you see are apoptosis. This is um, uh, altruistic suicide that I, a cell, will commit in order to let my brethren and sisteren uh, succeed. Um, and this is just a real-time, not real-time biology, but real-time in terms of the model uh, execution of the system. While this is happening, here is a very tiny piece of a small part of the state charts of three or four of the cells as they operate, so you can get a feeling for what's going on underneath the surface. So you have uh, five uh, T cells, just the top two or three levels of the state chart, and on the left top there's some control unit, um, and you can get a feeling for, for the dynamics of what is going on uh, beneath the surface. And finally, I want to show you uh, this, which is uh, a lot of people have said you spend such a lot of time and effort on modeling biology, you just to get nice pictures and nice videos? Well, of course not. You, you really would like to make biological discoveries. So we have made quite a few. Uh, nothing on the Nobel Prize level. Someone recommended that I add yet to that, but that would be a lot, much too, too presumptuous. Uh, Mid-level discoveries at the best. And one of the things we discovered here had to do with a particular chemical which gives these cells the ability to compete and elbow each other to get to communicate with the epithelial cells. And I want to show you what you'll see now is two runs of the system, on the top and on the bottom. On the top is a normal run, done slightly slower than the one I showed you a minute ago. Um, on the top, and on the bottom is the same system where we essentially shut down this chemical. So it's a little bit like taking from all the researchers in software engineering, shutting down your competition uh, gene. And uh, of course, many of you would not bother to come to Melbourne for this conference. Many of you would be doing other things in life. And what you'll see between the top and the bottom is in the top, you'll see, as you saw earlier, the cells competing, uh, this fierce competition on the left of the center area of the picture. And on the bottom, they couldn't care less. You know, they kind of go around. Some of them, by chance, become T cells. Some of them don't, they, and they don't really care because there's no uh, incentive to compete. So you can see this already, the uh, difference between the top and the bottom. And so th these kinds of things for me are very exciting, uh, as are all the other applications. And all in all, it's been a great four decades or so, and I've had lots and lots of fun, and I hope to have some more fun. And thank you so much for the award, IEEE Computer Society, and all of you for listening. Thank you. Thanks so much for the great presentation. I've, I've really enjoyed your work over many years. Um, been to some visual languages myself, but I guess one of the issues I've found is not specifying the formalism aspect perhaps as much as we should have. How critical is that duality of 
a visual language that, you know, I guess fits the cognitive state, the topology, et cetera, and linking it to a strong formalism. Has that, has that been absolutely critical for the success of state uh, do you think? Yes, it's been critical. And um, of course, the question is, what is the medium in which you write down the semantics? It can, again, be formal looking. Uh, the way we decided to do it is to give an operational semantics. Um, and uh, you can complain about that if you, if you want to. It's always. But then you can also complain about a lot of Greek letters in a formal looking specification. I'm not trying to judge either way. But yes, and I did admit that we did a lousy job in uh, putting forward the semantics of state charts in a timely fashion and we got flack for that uh, but there is I mean uh, there are many variants of the language the two main ones are the state mate version and the rhapsody version the rhapsody version also has a paper that's been published with the semantics and uh, yes uh, you don't want to let people use this if they don't understand what's going on but sometimes people still don't I just got e email about a week ago from someone who asked about a particular issue in state charts it wasn't clear to him what the semantics was and we had to uh, show him in the semantics where this appears and, and how it works out. There's no other question from the audience. I would congratulate again, uh, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please join me. Congratulations.